How to convince a prince? In today's episode, we talk about the Persian art of persuasion. Welcome to the Medieval Grad Podcast. It's a podcast brought to you by Medievalists.net, where we chat with graduate students and early career researchers to learn about the new trends in medieval studies. I'm Lucie Lemonnier, a medieval historian and the podcast's host. And today we are talking with Farah Zalidina, a PhD candidate at the Department of Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations at the University of Toronto here in Canada. Hello, Faraz. Thank you very much for joining me today. Hi, Lucy. Thanks for having me. So, Faraz, I've heard of your work on Persian literature and the art of persuasion because you won the first place at a couple of three-minute thesis competitions. So, congratulations, because it's not a prize often won by humanities students. Thank you so much. So let's turn to your research. Uh, you study the art of persuasion in literary texts written in Persia in the High Middle Ages. And uh, to give a better sense of your work, you use in some of your presentations the examples, uh, the example of the tales known as uh, 1001 Nights. Um, would you walk us through it? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, the Thousand and One Nights, uh, also known as uh, the Arabian Nights, are a collection of tales, folklore, and stories, uh, many of which existed um, probably you know, in ancient Persia, Sanskrit, and Greek before being translated into Arabic in around the 9th century. And all of these stories um, are housed basically under what's called a frame tale. And a frame tale is a, a story that contains other stories. So in the Canterbury Tales, the frame story is the pilgrims going on pilgrimage. Um, in the TV series, How I Met Your Mother, the frame tale is Ted uh, talking to his kids. And uh, The Thousand and One Nights contains one of the most famous frame tales of world literature. And while the authenticity of many of the interior tales have been subject of dispute, um, and Honestly, they probably reflect 18th century sensibilities more so than 8th century sensibilities. Uh, nevertheless, the, the frame tale is, is actually quite ancient in its provenance. Um, the Cliff Notes version is that there is an ancient king by the name of Shahriar who controls a vast empire all throughout Asia. But one day the king has brought the news that his wife has been cheating on him. And in a fit of rage, he executes his wife. And he then irrationally comes to believe that all women are unfaithful and decides to enact murderous revenge on all of them. He commands his vizier to bring him each day a new bride. However, by the next day's dawn, he has her executed. And this pattern continues of marriage, consummation, execution, every day for three long and bloody years. But in a twist, the vizier's daughter, a woman by the name of Shahrazad, inexplicably offers herself to the king. But she has a plan. Her solution is to entertain the king at night with a story and end on a cliffhanger, hoping that the king's curiosity would delay her execution. And her stories also contained deep ethical messages through which Shahrazad hoped uh, she might persuade the king to change his ways. And there are various endings given to this, this tale. Um, and, and today we can use the happy ending, which is that Shahrazad prevails. You know, the king sees the wrongs of his ways and spares for her life. Um, the brilliance, I think, in this frame story is that it depicts a king who was deaf to reason. You know, and if the, the last four years have taught us anything, it, it's that politicians sometimes will ignore even the starkest of facts, you know, even just in the past year. Um, but Shahrazad's uh, weapon of choice was stories. And stories were, in fact, one of the main mediums through which uh, rulers and regular people acquired a moral education, were habituated to custom, they learned about their religion, and even advised on political philosophy. And I think that's what's interesting to me, you know, that these stories aren't just conveyor belts of information, they're recognized as means of persuasion. Today we talk about economic incentives and rational actors, but really if you want to get anyone to do anything, First you, have to, first, you have to change their mind, and that's what stories are for. Although the, the story of the 1001 Nights is really uh, fascinating, your research does not focus on them. You actually uh, study the works of a poet named Attar, 
who lived in Iran in the late 12th and early 13th century. And Atar mastered the art of rhetoric and persuasion. So first, tell us a little bit about him and about his work. Yeah, so uh, I've been exploring some of the questions I've mentioned by specifically focusing on this one great storyteller of world literature, Attar. Um, however, we know very little about his life. One monograph on Attar begins by describing him as famous but unknown. And what, what we do know about him is that he lived in the late 12th and early 13th centuries um, and spent most of his life in Nishapur, which is today located in northeastern Iran. And he's buried, actually, just a stone throws away from the tomb of the poet Omar Khayyam. Attar's works uh, betray an intimate acquaintance with Islamic mysticism, but we have no evidence that he ever formally joined a Sufi order. And beginning around the 15th century, a great number of legends and spurious works accumulate on Attar's name. So there are probably 50 or 60 titles attributed to him, but his authentic works number no more than 10, to two of which are lost. And many of his stories are found in his Masnavi works. And a Masnavi is a poem of rhyming couplets. So A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, so on and so forth. And um, it was, you know, in part the ease of this rhyming scheme which suited it for long narratives and other epic forms of poetry. And that's... Okay, um, I have a quick follow-up question, um, which is not necessarily related directly to his work, but why why do you think, or why was this kind of a resurgence of interest for him in the 15th century? What happened at that time for Attar to become again a very important figure? Yeah, so it's definitely very, it's a very interesting question. Uh, this process, you know, happens gradually, and it tends to happen to a number of, of major poets where you get spurious works attributed to them. I think part of the reason, one of the reasons, is uh, with the rise of the Timurids, which was a, a, a dynasty which uh, most, you know, most famously known as founded by Tamerlane. Uh, the rise of the Timurids had a big impact because Attar was kind of rediscovered. Um, he was translated into Turkish at that period, and uh, one of his works, the Tezkirat al Awliya, uh, which is a hagiography of Sufi saints. Uh, becomes very popular, um, just and we can tell this by sheer the sheer number of manuscripts. And you know, political dynasties always like to attach themselves to saintly figures or famous poets. And Attar was one of them. And so they they even uh, redid and refurbished his tomb during this period. Um, and so I think that's one reason that there's a, a resurgence. I think there are a variety of one, but uh, I think that's one that you can really focus on. Okay, but he was also famous uh, when he was writing and living and breathing. You know, it's it's difficult to say. The fact that we don't have much historical information around him makes it very difficult to reconstruct the poetic circles that he was in, and especially because he he doesn't have a formal teacher. You, usually, everyone is attached to a teacher, um, but uh, there is little historical information about the, about him. Uh, in that sense, some of the earliest biographies or, you know, references to him that we think are historical before kind of the legend comes about are very short. You know, there is a, a probably authentic account of him meeting with Nasir Din Tusi, who is a very famous uh, Shi'i uh, theologian, philosopher and uh, astronomer. Um, and so he, he definitely was in literary circles, um, yeah. but he did not have a huge following. Uh, and, and usually these followings only, you know, accumulate after death. So for us to get a better sense of Atal's tales of persuasion, could you tell us one or two stories he wrote and uh, what he wanted the readership to, you know, take away and be persuaded of? Sure. So I'll tell one anecdote uh, that, that features prominently in, in one of the chapters of my dissertation. And it's a story about Anushirwan, who is a the sixth century king of the pre-Islamic Sasanian dynasty in Iran. And according to Attar's version, uh, one day Anushirvan is riding his horse when he comes across a very old man planting a tree that only bears fruit after a number of years. Uh, usually it's a walnut or a, or a coconut tree. So King Anushirvan asks the old man why he would be planting a tree whose fruits he would never be able to enjoy. 
where the old man responds, no, oh, there is reason enough, because many have planted for us so that we may reap its benefit today, we too shall plant for the sake of others. You know, this is a beautiful sentiment, and Anushirvan is mightily impressed, and he rewards the old man by giving him some gold, you know, well done. Uh, and now the old man ex exclaims, oh my, this planting has not made me wait 10 years. It has borne fruit this very day, you know, referencing the gold. And now, you know, Anushirvan is even more pleased. He's even uh, more excited by this wonderful quip. Um, and he bestows the old man with uh, the land, uh, the entire village, and its water. So not bad. For a day's work <laughs> yeah right and um, and this story it shows up in a whole variety of sources um, in various versions it could, you can find it in arabic anthologies persian anthologies uh, persian mirrors for princes mystical treatises one collection actually of the thousand and one nights has them attributed to a different caliph uh, i've even found a parallel story in hebrew um, it's it's everywhere and Every time the story is told, it's used for a different purpose. So in one Persian for Mirrors, print, Mirrors for Prince's work, the story appears under the heading on acknowledging the merits of worthy servants and slaves. Not, not that exciting. In Attar, however, the organizing principle of his work is the frame tale. And this gives us a bit of insight into how we might interpret the anecdote. So the story appears in one of Attar's Masnavis, you know, the poem of rhyming couplets, couplets uh, entitled the Ilahi Name. And the frame tale of this uh, poem centers around a king who is both the father and a kind of spiritual guide to his six sons, his six princes. And he asks each one what their highest wish in life is. And the entirety of the Ilahi Name is the king responding to his sons and attempting to persuade them to choose the higher and finer goals of life. So the first prince tells his father that his most desired wish is to win over the daughter of the king of the fairies. And when this happens, the father then marshals a number of anecdotes to demonstrate the dangers of falling prey to you know, the baser desires within us. And it's light of it's in light of this context that the story of Anushirvan and the old man appear, and then they appear a little differently. The old man now is fighting against his body, which is aging, and would probably rather not the old man subjected to such toil. But the old man articulates a higher purpose. He has a, a greater good in mind. And this selfless act actually ends up being rewarded. Right, And so the message the young prince should take from this, I think, uh, is, is clear. But stories like this are, are typical of Attar. I think they are deceptively straightforward. And I think a little digging reveals uh, complexity and nuance, and I think really sophisticated techniques of persuasion. And uh, you know, I could go on and on about this one an anecdote, uh, but I'll spare you. Uh, but that's just one example. And so let's talk about these techniques. Um, in your dissertation, you ask why Attar chose the form of short stories to convince, and you also ask how. So first, let's talk a little bit about the why. So why, why do you think uh, the short stories are maybe better tailored to convince and persuade the readers? Do you have a preliminary answer to that question, to the question of the form? Yeah, well, you know, I should make clear that uh, fictional stories, uh, animal fables, legendary tales, um, these kinds of works were not universally accepted as appropriate methods of education. There, there's controversy around them. So, uh, for example, um, it is said that the 10th century Abbasid Caliph, al Radi, when he was a child, he had his books confiscated by his grandmother because she Aww. wanted to, I know, very sad, she wanted to inspect what he was reading to ensure that he was getting, you know, a proper education, an education befitting a would-be caliph. And when she found them to be books of jurisprudence, philology, poetry, all reputable subjects, you know, she returned them, uh, or she had someone else return them. And then the boy retorted to her, you know, these are all purely learned and reputable books. They are not what you read, stories of the sea, the history of Sinbad, or the fable of the cat and mouse. 
And I, th I think um, this kind of denigration of quote unquote popular literature, it, you know, it continues today. Yeah. But parallel to this negative view, stories you know, were recognized as useful means of persuasion and education, going back all the way to uh, Aristotle's rhetoric, which uh, was translated into Arabic. Um, in fact, Ibn Rushd, uh, known in the West as Averroes, uh, the 13th century philosopher, says about fables that they allow for a close examination of concepts. So rather than grasping the entirety of the thing without explication, fables and stories focus on the particulars and on things concomitant or related to that thing. You know, it paints a, a fuller picture. And I think this is but one reason why stories could have appealed to Attar, though I think, again, there are many. What about now the how? So how did Attar design his stories to make them persuasive and to convince the readers to, to do this or that or to, you know, behave in a certain ways? And the, the kind of the follow-up question, it's a two-barrel question, um, is what are the tenets of the Arabic and Persian art of rhetoric? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll take the second one first. Uh, okay. the, the study of rhetoric in, in Arabic and Persian uh, it basically occurs on two parallel but related tracks. So on the one hand, we have works in the tradition of Aristotle's rhetoric, and I've referenced the commentary by Averroes, um, and we also have commentaries by Al-Farabi and uh, the great Avicenna. And then on the other hand, we have uh, manuals of literary eloquence, which primarily deal with the use of rhetorical figures and tropes in poetry, such as um, metaphor, simile, uh, amphibology, etc. But at the level of uh, narrative, theory somewhat lags application. But uh, one common tactic that Attar uses for making a story persuasive is, is repurposing an existing one rather than conjuring something anew. And so, you know, the example we've seen is Anu Shirvan and the Old Man, a common story that he's repurposed. And the writer expects the reader to be familiar with the broad outlines of the story and using it taps into a collective memory and, and it harnesses the credibility of history. It's almost like a deja vu effect, you know. You've heard this story, let me tell it to you again. But then by subverting the reader's expectations and redirecting the story's meaning, Attar breathes a new life into it. And so there's a kind of meta-referentiality to, to all these stories. Um, do you see these discursive strategies still at play in our modern world? I, I think rhetoric will always be relevant in a world where people have competing interests. Yeah. Right. Um, I think there is a false view of rhetoric, which sees its only purpose as misleading people. But rhetoric, like any art or science, can be abused. And I think that is what makes it all the more imperative to recognize um, that you know, humans cannot be reduced to data points. We're more than that. Uh, we are our stories. Yeah, and we still love to you know, be told stories and listen yeah. to stories and watch stories and learn from stories. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, to conclude, Faraz, I have a quick question uh, that I ask my guests and which is related to grad school. What do you enjoy the most about it? And what do you find to be the most challenging? Um, what do I enjoy most? Um, I love how uh, doing a PhD is, is intellectually stimulating, but also operates at a, at a fast pace. You know, as a doctoral student, you're racing against the clock to when your funding runs out. <laughs> and I like that the PhD is both uh, cerebral and, and also intense. Uh, in terms of the biggest challenge, uh, I, I think it can be a little isolating at times. Um, and I think with the pandemic especially, that's made it, uh, that's kind of exacerbated it, uh, which is why I'm, I'm so grateful to have been able to uh, come on your podcast and uh, share some of what's been on, on my mind and coop up uh, inside with me, um, with your audience. So yeah, thank you so much for that. Well, thank you very much, for us. It was really lovely and very interesting to have you here. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. 
That was Farah Zalidina, a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. You can find out more about Farah's in the show notes. Stay with us because the episode isn't over yet. Let's bring in Peter Konichny from Medievalist.net. Hi, Peter. How are you? What did you think of the interview? Hey, I'm doing good. And yeah, I enjoyed listening because uh, I really get a fascination for medieval, uh, medieval Middle Eastern literature. Um, one thing I kind of find interesting about it is how it's it can be really huge and kind of this episodic, right? So this, you have to kind of think of like a, a thousand and one nights and things like that as you know, the, their own versions of the Marvel universe, oh, the Star yeah. Wars universe, <laughs> like, because you often, often have these constant additions uh, and, uh, and new versions and reworkings, uh, like, in we don't see, it, we don't kind of, kind of see it because we're looking at it like hundreds of years back in the past. So we just see this one big group of stuff, but back then, you know, it's like, you know, hey, here's a story. Let's add on to it. Let's make it, you know, let's add a bit more. Let's add in a new character. Uh, you know, or let's retcon somebody, right? Uh, and and so you have that. And that's part of the reason I think we also see, um, like, this author, Athar, his name gets reused, like, in the 15th century, right? Yeah. It's because people are, hey, we've got these stories, but, you know, we want to add more, right? So, you know, and they say, hey, let's, you know, he's part of the author in, in the same, same ones, you know, like there's no, he's just, an, it's just a name yeah, uh, to continue on. So, you know, and this, this, you know, we don't know who really, you know, like we have like Star Wars is George Lucas. Oh, well, it has him doing Star Wars for like you know, 20 years, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, and it happened a lot in the Middle Ages, whether in the Middle East or in Europe, where you just have a lot of, uh, as you said, like several authors who will um, contribute to the same storyline, let's say, for instance, like the the author story, or you also have manuscript without any author, and people will just say, "Oh, okay, let's say it's Aristotle, or let's say it's, it's Athar," and so it also gives some authority to a manuscript that might not have been as famous, if not pseudo pseudo authored by a famous name exactly exactly because you were trying to you know get a little shine from the from the greats right so <laughs> yes absolutely but, yeah i think it was very interesting also um the fact that the same story can have uh, different meanings philosophical mm -hmm. meanings different teachings depending on what you want to communicate to your mm -hmm. audience Indeed, indeed. And like often, sometimes this audience is the royalty, right? You're trying to, uh, you're writing for yeah. them and you're trying to tell them stories. So like, yeah, you, when you are persuasive, you're, you sometimes like my audience is an audience of one because that's the person who's paying me. <laughs> so, Yeah, absolutely. And um, something else also, I think that uh, Farah uh, pointed out and that's, that resonates with today is the fact that stories really help convince people sometimes more than fact and i think we we've seen it which is often with science and maybe all, with all the pandemic that sometimes it's better to just tell the stories of individual people instead of just giving numbers 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 because we relate to stories we relate to life stories and then we remember what we what we learned yeah, I think it's a very classic way of, of doing it and probably something we don't do today. Like, I think Aesop was onto something when <laughs> yeah. he did Aesop's fables, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah, it was, it was a cool episode. I enjoyed it a lot. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks. You are listening to the Medieval Grad Podcast, brought to you by Medievalists.net. If you want to support us and this podcast, you can subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash medievalists. You can get a lot of neat benefits on Patreon, including being able to hear the episodes early. We love doing the show and we really appreciate your help. I'm Lucie Lomonier. You can find me on Instagram. My handle is at the French Medievalist. And you can look me up on academia.edu. Thank you very much for tuning in. Au revoir.